Excellent. We are recording. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madhu Raman, for joining us uh, virtually from Mumbai. I think you're in. You said you're actually in Bangalore today, but yep. um, uh, and uh, thank you for agreeing to give this talk. Uh, we look forward to hearing about uh, Chevy Chepwell's automorphic structures, uh, etc., and resurgence especially. <laughs> okay, uh, so you can start whenever you want. Thanks okay. very much. Um, so thank you very much for the uh, invitation to speak about some work uh, that my uh, collaborator and I uh, did sometime last year. Um, uh, uh, so I'm, I'm currently affiliated to TIFR in Mumbai and my collaborator, uh, P.N. Bala Subramanian, he's, a, he's just joined as a faculty member uh, a few months ago at uh, NIT Calicut, which is in the south of India, uh, and also a good friend of Bal's. So, um, yeah. So great, so let's begin. There are broadly uh, three themes that sort of run through this talk. Uh, the, the first uh, is periods, the second is deformations, and the third is resurgence. And now what I mean by these is, and I will explain all of these things as I go along, uh, periods, uh, by periods I refer to uh, the sort of geometrical structures that are at play underlying our system, uh, deformations, are a way of getting around a particular kind of obstruction. Uh, and that obstruction is to demonstrating a particular kind of resurgence, okay? So that's, uh, that's roughly the, the set of ideas uh, in the talk. And, I, and I, of course, I will explain what each of these, what I mean by each of these things uh, as I go along. Uh, and of course, please feel free to interrupt me at uh, any point with questions. I'm happy to take this as easy as, as uh, need be. So let's start with periods. Uh, by periods, what I mean, uh, as I said, uh, are the geometrical structures underlying the physical problem. And this has historically been an incredibly fruitful way of understanding and uncovering new and interesting uh, physical mathematical structures. So I, I, this is just a sort of generic representation of a geometrical surface here, a genus, uh, a genus four Riemann surface. Uh, and there's a bunch of arrows coming out, which is n equals two gauge theories, integrable systems, topological strings, quantum mechanics, and matrix models. So if you take any pair of these uh, uh, fields, there is a kind of deep relationship between them. So for example, with n equals two gauge theories and integrable systems, there is the classic work of uh, Cyborg and Witten, which was developed on by um, uh, Donagi and Witten and also Docker and Fong, which, which basically says that, you know, to any n equals two uh, gauge theory, you have uh, an associated integrable system. So for example, uh, uh, just, just, uh, just was one example of, of many, uh, if you consider what, what are called the n equals two star theories or the mass deformed n equals four uh, super young mills, that's, that's kind of dual in, in the sense to uh, an elliptic Caligaro moser system. Um, let's take any other pair of guys, n equals two gauge theories and topological strings. There's work by Dijkraaf and Waffa, uh, and, and they also talk a lot about matrix models. Um, uh, recently, of, of particular interest to, to Bala and I was uh, quantum mechanics and topological strings. Now, this is a series of papers written by um, Marcus Mourinho uh, and his collaborators, uh, Alba Grazzi, uh, Santiago Colacido where they, what they try and do is they try and show that for the sort of problems that arise in quantum mechanics, that is uh, sort of problems in spectral theory, um, the techniques of topological strings can be uh, very, very useful and uh, very productive. Uh, having said that, uh, a lot of these studies, uh, specifically the study that I'm, uh, we, uh, Bala and I were looking at, uh, they, a lot of them focus on the simple nature of geometry at genus one. If you have a genus one surface or a torus, Right, the geometry is quite simple and, and very well understood, and um, and in in that case you're able to sort of make uh, make make quite a bit of progress. Uh, what what we wanted to do was we wanted to understand what happens at higher genus at genus two. Right, this is uh, an effort to further clarify the picture uh, in a slightly more general context where the Riemann surface is not just a torus. Right. So the, the, what we're going to try and do throughout the talk is we're going to try and understand genus two, okay? But I, I will sort of provide uh, occasionally some background for genus one and the kind of things that we're trying to do that up till now have only been shown for genus one. 
uh, he, uh, the second theme in this talk, one of the themes in this talk is, is resurgence. And this refers very broadly, sorry, this refers very broadly to the study of the relationship between perturbative and non-perturbative effects or perturbative and non-perturbative non contributions to various observables in quantum systems, whether they be quantum mechanical, quantum field theoretic, um, it, it doesn't matter. So I'm going to give you sort of a, a, a this is a sort of rough classification of the sort of resurgence that has been studied. Um, let's look at the first one. I'm going to call this large orders, low orders, right? And so let's say I have, uh, I uh, using just the usual methods of quantum mechanics, or if I'm looking at a field theory, quantum field theory, let's say I'm looking at uh, something like the ground state energy. And I'm computing what the ground state energy is um, in perturbation theory, right? So I have um, the G is my coupling constant, and I'm computing the coefficient CK order by order in um, order by order in perturbation theory. Um, the statement of large orders, low orders resurgence is the statement that uh, the large order growth of the coefficient CK. Sorry, can you see my cursor uh, when I'm in pointing to something? Yes, okay. So, uh, so uh, when I'm looking at the large orders growth of the coefficients CK, right, then what that's going to do, so that's represented here by the blue, sort of the end part of this. Um, it is not a great representation, but this is the sort of perturbative sector, and these are the contributions in the non-perturbative sector, right, where you have, uh, you have an exponentially suppressed prefactor and then a perturbation series around it. Um, what we uh, the, the expectation of large orders low orders resurgence is that the large order behavior of c sub k is going to tell me something about the low orders behavior in the non perturbative sector right so the leading order large k behavior large k growth of these coefficients is going to tell me something about this this guy over here which is what we would call the instant on action and the sub leading guys would tell us about the coefficients d sub l Right. And uh, this is this is an expectation that has been found uh, to be true in uh, a series of really uh, important papers by uh, Zinjistan and uh, Jen Shura and uh, a number of other authors since then in a variety of uh, largely quantum mechanical systems. Um, and the expectation is, and it's also been shown for finite dimensional integrals by Berry and Howells and um, uh, that school of work on, on hyper asymptotics. And this is the expectation is that this form of resurgence is generic, right? So any system is going to exhibit uh, any any quantum mechanical system it is expected will exhibit this sort of resurgence. Uh, again, when I say resurgence here, I just mean large orders, low orders resurgence. I just mean large order growth of perturbative coefficients determine low order growth of non perturbative uh, in, in the non perturbative sector. Okay. There is also a, another form of uh, uh, the resurgence, uh, which is low orders, low orders resurgence. And here I have the same picture, right? Except in this case, uh, the statement of low orders, low orders resurgence is that the low order growth of the low orders in, in, in the perturbative sector determine the low orders in the non-perturbative sector. And the expectation is that this is not a generic feature of quantum systems, uh, that uh, it is only true in certain very nice special examples. Uh, and uh, the focus is the focus today, uh, at least for us, is going to be on low orders, low orders resurgence. Okay. So uh, I'll pause here if there are any questions. Okay. This stuff is coming from the work of Ekal, right? Um, yes, yes. The the work of Ekal uh, is uh, very important for um, uh, for for just the subject of resurgence in general, um, but also a, a number of other authors since him. Yeah. But originally, yes, it all sort of comes from comes from uh, this idea that you know uh, generically, you, you know, you, you very often you have to deal with divergent series, and divergent series um, have a lot to say about the the sort of or, or asymptotic series have a lot to say about the functions that uh, they asymptote to. So, okay. So what I'm going to do is, I mean, like, I'm sorry for this, the slides being so elementary, but like, it, it's nice to see things explicitly. So I'm going to look at like some potential, a quantum mechanical potential, and I'm going to show that it's going, it's going to be associated with the Riemann surface, right? Uh, so let's say this is my potential. The, the, the orange line is it's just some uh, potential function. 
And uh, let's say I have the energy picked out somewhere over here. And then what I can do is I can mark out the branch points, right? Uh, uh, which are the sort of classical turning points. And these classical turning points, they sort of demarcate the uh, classically allowed regions, which are these blue valleys over here, and the classically disallowed regions, so the peaks over here. So a classical particle at this energy is only going to be able to stay in, let's say, this region or this region, and they cannot sort of jump over this barrier, right? Uh, now let's just focus on the branch cuts and, and we observe that it's sort of natural to associate a cycle that wraps around the branch cut. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's introduce a set of cycles and also a set of dual cycles that are um, that intersect canonically with them. So the cycles in blue uh, are what I'll call the A cycles and the cycles in red are, are what I'll call the, the, the B cycles. So the A cycles correspond uh, to perturbative motion, right? or small oscillations. You'll see from this picture over here that there's branch cuts connecting the, the uh, tops of these valleys. So the, the A cycles which wrap this are kind of associated with the perturbative motion at the bottom of the well. And the B cycles are associated to the sort of tunneling, tunneling effects that I might have in this quantum mechanical system. So I have a set of cycles over here. And what I can do is I can, I can just think of these cycles as being associated to a higher genus stream on surface right, uh, in, in, in this fashion. And uh, this, is, uh, this is, of course, very generic and should not be at all surprising, actually, because we started off with this quantum mechanical system defined by some potential, and we found a Riemann surface. And we can see this just by writing down the expression for the Hamiltonian in a slightly different way. Um, so you know, if I look at the XP plane, right, I have P square equals xi minus V of X. Xi here is the energy, and V of X is some potential of, of some degree. And what I see is that for every value of xi, right, uh, this defines for me uh, uh, what, what we would call a hyperelliptic curve. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Okay. From what I remember, in the quantum mechanics case, all the branch points are square root branch points. Yes. Whereas in the human surface case, it is not. The pi one is quite complicated. Okay? Mm -hmm. So the mapping does not capture the uh, topology of the quantum mechanics in the Riemann surface case. Am I not right? Um, well, why do you say that? Well, because like if I if I just have, if I if I just forget this and I just write like y square equals f of x, where f of x is let's say um, uh, an order four polynomial, right? Then that's going to give me two cuts, right? Yes. It gives the branch point, locations of the branch points, right? But it seems to me it doesn't give the uh, uh, what is the uh, universal covering? How often does it cover? In the quantum mechanics case, it's always two. Here, it can be anything. No, uh, well, well, I'm I'm talking about the the the, the quantum mechanics case uh, here. Okay, I, but I, you're I'm, associating it to a Riemann surface. Yes, yes. Um, why why is that a problem? I mean, like if, if I just have like let's say two square root branch cuts, right? Connecting. Oh, the, the, so you are right? not really meaning. I'm sorry, you're right. The, you're not really meaning the S two with a lot of handles. This surface, this object you are writing, right. is not the two dimensional Riemann surface. It is simply a Riemann surface or the quantum mechanics problem. No, it is it is a it is a two dimensional Riemann surface. I, I'm saying that like I have a, a, a square root branch cuts, right? And so what I do is I I have two sheets, right? And I I, I sort of take uh, the let's say the upper sheet I add a point at infinity, take the lower sheet and add a point at infinity. So then I, I have two spheres that are connected by two tubes. Yeah, it's my confusion because huh. in two dimensional in two two manifolds are classified by the genus, okay? right? And I was thinking that you are looking at the two manifolds completely uh, as, and you are embedding the uh, structure of the uh, uh, Riemann surface given by the zeros of the C psi, C psi onto mm -hmm. these two manifolds, identifying one with the other. That is not the case from what I understand. The two manifolds have no singularity, no, it is simply a smooth surface. And there are cycles there. Okay? Yeah, yeah. So, two so, are so two are different. Okay? Right. So, so I the, think so his hyperelliptic are... sort of, I mean, the expression you've written there for p squared is just a standard hyperelliptic one as long as p is, uh, as long as v is polynomial. Yeah. 
isn't it? So yes. that, I'm not sure what your confusion is, Bob. It, it is not, not the, the quantum mechanical problem. If you look at it, there are square root branch points. On, yeah. on the other hand, the, the uh, two-dimensional complex manifolds do not have any, they are just smooth manifolds. Okay? Um, there are no branch points. It is just a, a surface with a fundamental group which is non-trivial. Okay? So this was my confusion, but I think the, it has been cleared. I have no, I don't think, we, by, the, by the way, to get hyperelectric Vx must be of a certain order, no? Just yes, so V of X has order. to be of order four or great, uh, not, not, uh, greater two, than four. Greater than four is, is hyper elliptic. Uh, uh, three and four is uh, elliptic. And of course, below that, you just have algebraic curves, like uh, rational curves. Okay, you go on. Right. So, so this is, um, this is, uh, this, so C of C of Xi is, is a one parameter uh, family of, uh, hyperelliptic curves, right? The genus G here is determined by the order of V of X. Oh, sorry, the degree of the polynomial. Uh, is there a question? No, it is. Where is joining us? Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, Uh, I'm sorry, we can't hear you. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, we, we really can't hear you. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, did you want? Hello? Um, uh, so you you assume that that v is a polynomial, or do you also deal with much? Yeah. Okay. In this, case, I'm, I'm I'm assuming that they're polynomial. Yes. Okay. So uh, uh, at this case, uh, in in this case, I have a, a hyperelliptic curve of genus G. G is determined by the degree of the polynomial uh, in X. Uh, and in general, this is a for for my cases, this is going to be a hyperelliptic curve. I'm going to specialize further uh, to a very nice set of polynomials, uh, which we'll see in a moment. Um, but let's let's sort of build a little bit more. Uh, the, so the goal in uh, in life for all cycles is to sort of pair up with one forms that they can be integrated along. Uh, and there is a sort of natural choice of a one form in this case, which is very familiar to us. It's just the momentum which is just the square root of xi minus v of x. And what we can do is we can use this one form to, to define an action and a dual action in the usual way. Now, these of course are familiar to us from quantum mechanics courses. Uh, for example, uh, this guy over here, uh, a hat, uh, which is integrated over a B cycle is, the, the, is exactly the sort of object that you'd need to compute a, a tunneling probability in quantum mechanics. Um, so let me just explain the notation here. Uh, the zero uh, over here refers to these observables being classical. So it's leading order in, in an H bar expansion. Um, the index I labels uh, the valley or the peak, right? Um, which is the classically allowed or classically disallowed regions. And the notation A hat and A check are, are meant to sort of remind us that these quantities are computed uh, under peaks and across valleys respectively, okay? Uh, my advisor joked that this was uh, our most significant contribution to the subject, that uh, good notation, which I think is slightly mean, but it's okay. Um, uh, in uh, quantum mechanics, of course, uh, so all of this is classical, right? Uh, and in quantum mechanics, we have the Schrodinger equation, right? So what we can do is we can feed it a sort of all orders WKB ansatz. So I feed it an ansatz that looks like this, where we assume that Q of X uh, uh, has uh, uh, admits an expansion in each bar. And I can plug this into the Schrodinger equation. And uh, what I find is uh, one can show that the odd orders uh, uh, in this H bar expansion are related to the even orders and uh, that psi of X uh, takes on a form like this. Okay, so, so uh, all you need to know is just the even parts. The odd parts are total derivatives. Okay. 
So what uh, what we have here is actually an, an infinite family of forms, uh, Q even uh, dx. So I have Q0, which is the, the uh, classical uh, PDX, right? But then I have Q2, Q4, Q6, and so on. And I can integrate each of these things over A or B cycles. And so to each of these, I'm, I'm going to call these guys WKB forms. And to each of these forms, I can associate a sort of quantum period and a quantum dual period. Okay. So uh, A check, which is associated to a classical, uh, uh, sorry, A check to N I uh, is, is the object that is uh, integrated uh, in a classically allowed region or an A cycle. Uh, and I, I integrate the form Q2n, right? Uh, and similarly for, for the B cycles. Now, the classical and quantum actions together, they give formal expressions for quantum periods and dual periods. So uh, I, can, I can sum these guys like this, and I'm going to get um, uh, a sort of formal expansion uh, in, in both the energy and, uh, and, and H bar in Planck's constant. And the goal uh, of this talk will be to understand how the A to N of Xi are related, how these guys are related to each other. Okay. So all I've done so far is I've, I've just assumed an all orders WKB ansatz. I have a bunch of new uh, one forms and I'm gonna integrate each of those one forms and then add them up to give a sort of formal expression like that. Yeah. Good. So now that you know we've we've sort of framed our problem in in a geometrical fashion, we can we can lean on certain geometrical facts about Riemann surfaces, and I'm going to present these facts without proof, but they are, uh, you know, they, they're kind of uh, very basic properties of of uh, Riemann surfaces. So the first uh, is uh, the existence of picard fuchs equations, uh, and the statement here is that the periods and dual periods are solutions to differential equations. So um, Let's say there is a differential operator uh, 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 over here. In, in this case, uh, the differential operators are differential operators with respect to the independent variable xi, which is a, a sort of parameter in the curve. And the differential operators take the following form. Okay. Uh, and uh, this uh, here, what we're going to use, what we use in the computations at least, is that since the uh, periods or dual periods are themselves solutions to uh, uh, a differential equation of this form, the the differentials themselves, right, the one forms themselves, are going to be uh, zero up to total derivatives, right? That's the only thing that you can have on this side is a total derivative. Right? Uh, you can check that if if this if if this is true, then this is guaranteed to be true. Um, since you have a total derivative and you're integrating it over a non-contractible cycle, and you know you just get zero. So such a differential equation. Right? In our case, they're going to be ordinary differential equations. Such differential equations will have a fundamental system of solutions that can be constructed using a Frobenius ansatz. So I just assume a series ansatz for my solution, and uh, I just determine the series, uh, the, the, the relation between the coefficients in the usual way. So let's call that fun. Yeah. Uh, Madhu, uh, in the equation for the, the can you explain this Picard Fuchs equation? Yeah. Yellen is operating on the integral, right? Yes. But the integral is a number. So I don't understand what is meant by... No, so, so uh, okay, good. So so the, the integral here, Qn, right, is a function of x, but it's also a function of the parameter xi, right? Okay. So when I integrate over x, I still have some function of xi here, right? Because uh, if, 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 if you remember the, uh, let's say I take this guy over here, like the A period is a function of the parameter the energy at which you're looking at the curve. Oh, xi is, uh, is a parameter of the level you are looking. Uh, I don't. I, so, I don't so know. okay. So let's 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 go back to the curve. Xi is just the energy of oh, the, I see. Okay, of the fine. system. Okay, fine. So, okay, understand. Yeah. So varying xi corresponds to uh, moving this this line up or down. I understand. Um, right. Okay. Um, right. So, and, and this is the differential operator in Xi. So, so I mean, in, in the genus one case, of course, this is all very you know, easy to see because uh, you're going to have a second order differential operator, right? And it's gonna have two solutions. And uh, one of them is going to correspond to the, uh, one of them is correspond, going to correspond to the A cycle and the other is going to correspond to the B cycle. And um, 
uh, yeah. So so uh, when you when you consider when you construct a fundamental system, then you can it's, it's it's easy to show that let's say for example the periods they are linear combinations of the fundamental system, right? Uh, linear combinations of elements in the fundamental system, and these coefficients ci are fixed by perturbative computations, right? So just the usual way we we solve differential equations. Um, uh, so that's that's the first statement that you know the, we're going to use the Picard Fuchs equations. Uh, the second is the existence of certain differential operators. So in happy circumstances, it is, and I'm going to explain what those are. It is possible to construct differential operators d to n such that q to n, which is the two nth quantum WKB action, is given by d to n, which is a particular differential operator acting on q zero up to total derivatives, okay? Uh, and it turns out that this is always possible to do for genus one. Now, the question is, why would you want to do something like this? Well, the answer is that uh, the forms Q to N dx, they don't care about which cycles they're being integrated along, right? So the difference between dual periods uh, and, and periods is just a choice of cycles, but the WKB form itself stays the same. Uh, now, let's say we know uh, a check, right, which is the uh, period, the classical period, then because of this sort of relation, uh, if I act with this differential operator, which is again a differential operator in the energy, xi, uh, then uh, if I act with d2n on a check zero, then I'm going to get a check 2n, right, and this is by definition, because if I have a differential operator like this, uh, then I just act with D2n on this guy. I write this in terms of an integral over uh, Q, uh, uh, Q0, and then I push the derivative through, then I get this guy. So this is true by, de this, is true by, def by this definition. But also note that what's happening is that for the non-perturbative cycles, right, or the A hats, the same is true. So, uh, so if we pay close attention to what's happening here, if we know what these differential operators are, if we are able to construct these differential operators, then this allows us to determine quantum corrections to classical quantities associated to perturbative motion, but also allows us to determine quantum corrections to non-perturbative motion, uh, uh, non-perturbative uh, contributions, right? Because I'm using the same differential operator for both the, uh, uh, the the periods and the dual periods. Okay, so this is this is this is kind of important. So uh, I'll just I'll just kind of say that again. Uh, what's happening here is that if we are able to construct these differential operators, right? Then what these differential operators allow us to do is they allow us to de determine quantum corrections to classical quantities associated to the A cycles. But the same differential operators also allow us to construct quantum corrections to quantities uh, associated to B cycles or tunneling cycles. Okay, so this is a very concrete sense in which if I know, for example, the first few D2Ns, let's say I know D2, D4, D6, right? So what that's going to do is that's going to tell me what um, A check zero, uh, A, that's going to tell me that if I know A check zero, then it's going to tell me A check two, A check four, A check six, right? But it's also going to tell me what a hat to a hat for a hat six are. So this is the sense in which low orders in the H bar expansion of the perturbative cycles determine low orders of the uh, uh, of, of the H bar expansion in the non-perturbative cycles. Okay. So this is the the statement of uh, this is if if you like a sort of concrete realization of this low orders low orders resurgence. I'll, I'll just pause for a moment if there are any questions. Um, okay, um, I think uh, there aren't any questions. Uh, so, so let's uh, let, let's let's carry on. So, so what what we know now is that knowledge of quantum corrections to perturbative cycles comes with knowledge uh, of quantum corrections to non-perturbative cycles. This is the statement of low orders low orders resurgence. So now let's get to you know what we're doing in this paper. Uh, in this paper, what we do is we studied a very special class of potentials, uh, and here the potentials are labeled by uh, an integer m. Okay, this integer uh, m is m is greater than or equal to three, and um, 
it's it's given by the squares of Chebyshev polynomials. So uh, uh, Chebyshev polynomials are defined in the usual way, like this: T n of cos theta is cos n theta. Uh, and this is uh, these are Chebyshev polynomials of the first kind. And you know you can check, for example, if you look at m equals three or m equals four, uh, these are just going to give you the uh, cubic and quartic oscillators. Okay, so this is a family of potentials that generalizes the very uh, wi uh, widely studied cubic and quartic oscillators. Now, uh, the interesting thing about this class of potentials is that classically all of the periods and respectively all of the dual periods are proportional to each other. So in effect, there is, uh, there is only one independent period or dual period. That is classically, the system behaves as if it, it had genus one, okay? You can plot these uh, these potentials, and you'll see that the you know the curvatures of the uh, of the potential at the bottom of the well or the peak they're very different from well to well. But so it's 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 a striking property that one can prove that classically all of the periods and uh, and respectively all of the dual periods are proportional to each other. So classically, this system actually behaves as if it was genus one for any value of m. Now for M equals these, these four cases, M equals three, M equals four, M equals six, and M equals infinity, uh, this system actually has genus one. So it's, it's the, the real genus of this potential is genus one, which means in the case of uh, uh, an earlier work has established that, uh, this is early, earlier work that's done by uh, Basar, uh, uh, Dunn, and uh, Unsal. What they did was they were able to show that these potentials exhibit a low orders, low orders resurgence. That is that they were able to construct these differential operators. Sorry, Manu, is there some way of saying that these are genus one because they're quite high are the polynomials? Right. So, uh, so actually, the the m so, uh, so actually the, the is m. the same as the degree of the polynomial. So uh, uh, over here, uh, t uh, t three halves uh, square of x, right? Uh, you you can check that uh, this guy is actually a degree three polynomial. Yeah, but uh, the de degree six one, I would not expect that to be uh, yeah. so, uh, a uh, genus degrees, one. So right. is there some some way of saying that it's genus one for? Yes. So what happens is in, in the case how, of- is, How is that hidden there? Yeah. What? So, so in the case of, in the case of uh, M equals six, what happens is that uh, it's, it's a potential, but it's, it's a potential uh, uh, that only comes with like uh, even powers of X square. So you have X square, uh, x to the four and x to the six, so you can you can change variables, right? You can go to let's say z is x square, and then you can write it as a genus one object, a degree three polynomial. Okay. Um, good. So, but but the rest of the guys, uh, apart from these guys, everyone else is uh, is actually um, uh, of degree m, and uh, in in general they are not uh, they are not genus one at all by no means. Um, so uh, earlier work by, by Basar, Dunn, and Unsal, it had established that these potentials exhibit low orders, low orders resurgence, which is they constructed these differential operators for these special cases. And what we wanted to do was, because these were a very nice class of potentials that have some nice pro properties, even classically, which I, I will talk about right now. I have a question, um, sorry. Huh? I have a question following up on Denjo. Yeah. This, this TNs are called, they cosine, cosine polynomials, cosine. Yes. So they're periodic. So I would imagine that because of the periodicity, coming back to the original equation you wrote down for finding the genus, p squared mm. uh, psi minus, uh, p squared equal to psi minus this, this v, v, I think. Yeah. I would expect that there are a lot of zeros on that object, okay? Because it is a, it's a periodic function that is coming there. So these, these are actually, they, so they're not periodic. Uh, they, they, I'm, I'm looking at Chebyshev polynomials on the real line. So, uh, so uh, I'm looking at, so for example, let's say uh, cost two, the, uh, let's say uh, like uh, N equals two, right? Um, with this definition, uh, co cost two theta is just two cos square theta minus one. So that's, so the potential that I'm looking at is two X square minus one. Oh, you're changing, I don't understand. So you're treating cost as a real variable on the line. Um, no, I, I'm, I'm, how do I say this? The, the Chebyshev polynomials uh, are defined on, you know, usually defined on minus one to one, right? Uh, and uh, this is the sort of compact definition of them um, in terms of uh, the cosine uh, function. 
Okay, but the cosine function is periodic in X. Yeah. So what I'm saying is that you, you forget 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 theta, just treat it as a function of cos uh, cos uh, theta. Uh, so you're allowing you cos to go over the full real line. Yeah. So typically, I would I would sort of only restrict it to be from minus one to one, right? Yeah. But then I can I can analytically continue. So. So that is not analytically. The statement is really. No, I think the statement really is that, it, that the, it's a polynomial in cos. It's and if you call it an x, it's a polynomial in x. Sure. Once you decide that x is a real valued from number, then the polynomial can be anything. It's a way of uh, uh, codifying what the. Polynomial it's just a way of defining the polynomials. I but there is a issue. At least I was thinking when I was thinking about this problem. That this cos n theta is mm. like the Legendre polynomials, but for the group SO4. I okay. think he would know. So I was thinking that that I, is. I, 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 he's just specifying the coefficients. There are numbers that are coefficients in the polynomial, uh, which are easily specified by Tn of cos, x, cos theta is okay. cos of n theta. When you okay. re rewrite it in terms of cos, yeah. I think that's all. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's nothing there's nothing uh, very deep happening here. It's not. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so I mean, this is just a convenient way of saying that. Um, uh, so so good. So uh, what we do in this? Sorry. Sorry. You're breaking. Sorry, Denjo, you're breaking. You you're breaking up. I don't know what yeah. you're talking about. It's okay. I will. I won't ask the question. It's Sorry, no. You, it's it's clearer now. Um, uh, if you if you want to repeat. The... I was still confused. I was still confused uh, as to the uh, why the sixth order one uh, the change of variable didn't look so obvious because there's a you have a square root of a sixth order polynomial uh, integrated dx. But changing from from x to x squared is going to bring in it. The, the measure doesn't quite match. I would I needed x dx to, for it to work. Oh, you mean in the in the uh, you mean when you're looking at the uh, integral dx p of x kind of thing? Yes. Ah, no. So, yes. so what, the way the way I'm thinking about it is that you you start off with the sixth order guy, right? And then you perform this change of variables at the level of the curve before um, before going to the writing down the differentials and so on. But now I'm defining a very different quantum mechanical problem because I'm defining my momenta as being square roots of something different. The, and that uh, the square root of something t, uh, integrated dx. Right. So it looks like a very different quantum mechanical problem. Hmm. I mean, I see the mathematics you're talking about. That it, it looks like in the, the elliptic curve is genus one, but the physics does not look like it's going to pass anymore. Um, um, maybe I can get back to this uh, at the end. Uh, yeah. I, I, uh, just one remark, uh, Denjo, you are right, uh, but these, these are all canonical periods and uh, one has double cover of uh, G, uh, G equal one gives, uh, gives G equal two in, in that case. So the problem, uh, the, the more precise language would be the whole thing reduces uh, to G equal one. But uh, I think uh, the, uh, you're right that one looks at, at different periods that uh, PDX and, and PDX squared is, is something different, but of course, they are all periods with the same problem. Yes. Yeah, um, I, I think, yeah, I, I don't think I could have said that better. Um, uh, so, so maybe, maybe I'll just uh, carry on. Uh, so, but maybe we can discuss this after as well. Um, so the subtlety for, for the uh, M equals, let's say the M equals five case, M equals five is the specific example that we work out is, uh, this is a genus two example, uh, is that when quantum corrections are taken into account, the periods and dual periods are no longer proportional to each other, right? Now, obviously the same D2N 
cannot give quantum periods that are different, right? So if it's genus two, that means it has like two, two A cycles and two B cycles. And it's not it, it, the same D2 and the same differential operator cannot give you uh, quantum periods that are different. And the question is, how do we get around this? Uh, but before we go on to the, the, the quantum mechanics, uh, I want to make a few comments about the classical, the classical problem. And the class, uh, when we're discussing the classical problem, uh, I mentioned earlier that since all the periods and dual periods are proportional to each other, the system behaves as if it were a genus one system classically. And you know we can actually associate a, a, a sort of complex structure modulus to this um, this this effective genus one system, right? Which I've written down over here. And you can you can check that the the, the modular transformations uh, uh, of this uh, tau are generated by uh, the, the the letter t, which sends tau to tau plus one, and s, which sends tau to minus one over lambda m times tau. Um, where lambda m is a very specific function of m, it's four times uh, co cosine square pi over m. Okay, and uh, it really, uh, this is uh, it was sort of fortuitous that you know we would stumble upon this problem because uh, a very similar kind of expression has sort of appeared in some work that we uh, I, I did during my PhD on supersymmetric gauge theories. Okay, so uh, what's happening in this slide is just that I have. Uh, for, for arbitrary m, arbitrary finite m, uh, all the periods and dual periods are proportional to each other, which means there is effectively just one uh, independent uh, complex structure modulus, one tau. That tau is given by this expression over here, right? Uh, and uh, you can, uh, the, the modular transformations for this object are generated by the letters s and t, where t, t is the usual uh, tau goes to tau plus one, but s is different. And over here, S sends tau to minus one over lambda M times tau. Now you can check that for M equals three, four, six, and infinity, um, what's going to happen is lambda M is going to be an integer, right? And uh, if lambda M is an integer for three, four, six, and infinity, uh, what you can show is that these letters S and T, they generate what are called, uh, uh, they, uh, they generate subgroups of SL2Z that have finite index in them. These are called congruent subgroups, uh, but for all the other m's, right? Which is uh, which is the 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 higher genus m's, like m equals five, m equals thirty-seven. For all the other guys, these are not subgroups of SL2Z. They are in fact like subgroups of SL2R, and we know exactly what kinds of subgroups of SL2R. They're 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 what are called Hecke groups. Okay, so Hecke groups are subgroups of SL2R. They satisfy the following relations: that S they're, they're, they're generated by the, all words generated out of the letters S and T, where S squares to one and S times T whole power M is one. So, uh, in, in, uh, so for M equals three, for example, this is the usual uh, SL2Z, right? But uh, for higher M's, uh, you know, we, uh, it, these, these, are, these are what are called Hecke groups. Uh, and in, you know, my collaborators and I have been studying Hecke groups just as a sort of you know, mathematical curiosity for some time now. Um, uh, and uh, one of the things that we can do, which, is, which we think is kind of cool, is uh, we can take an expression that looks like this, and then we can invert it. Right? We can write down, uh, so here tau is written as a function of xi, and we can write down now xi as a function of tau. Now, this sort of inversion is typically very difficult to do. Uh, uh, as I've said, uh, for the cases m equals three, four, six, and infinity, this sort of inversion is known. And the inversion formulas are what are called Jacobi inversion formulas. So what we did was we studied this problem. We were able to write down for arbitrary m, uh, a sort of generalized Jacobi inversion formula, right? So uh, the, this expression over here, uh, I'll tell you what, what the ingredients are, but this expression over here is, is giving xi as a function of tau where over here we had tau as a function of xi, okay? Now, what, what are the ingredients that go into this? Uh, J sub M of tau is what's called a Hauk module. It's, it's, it's basically an analog of the Klein J invariant, which is the, um, which is the uh, uh, it's, it's a modular invariant function uh, uh, of tau. Uh, that is, it's invariant under all uh, SL2Z action. And D sub M, is the value of the this Hauk module at the fixed point of the S action, okay? 
Uh, so just in the same way that J, the, the usual Klein J invariant, when you evaluate J at the fixed point of the S action, which is I, which is tau equals I. So J of I is one, seven, two, eight, right? That's the sort of uh, classic, uh, uh, very familiar number for, uh, for people who study genus one. Uh, over here, uh, J at the fixed point of the S action, where the S action I, I sort of described over here, uh, is 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 dm, okay? So what we've done here is we've really sort of put uh, the Chebyshev polynomials in a one-to-one -one correspondence with uh, subgroups of uh, SL2R, which are, which are these Hecke groups, right? And we can we can do something kind of nice. One of the questions that we can ask is how do du duality transformations work out if J sub m is invariant under the Hecke action, right? I have over here. Um, uh, an inversion formula that uh, is in terms of uh, j, j sub m of tau and j sub m is invariant under all uh, Hecke action. Uh, the answer is that for, for the S transformation, for example, the monodromy of JM around the fixed point of the S action is what generates your duality transformation. So uh, when I send j, of m, uh, j sub m minus dm to e to the two pi i times uh, j sub m minus dm, Right. What that does here is right because this guy is under a square root. It's going to pick up uh, an e to the i pi, which is going to flip the sign here, and and similarly over here. Right. What's going to happen is this guy is going to get flipped. Right. So the s kind of exchanges xi with one minus xi. Okay. So that's what. Uh, so the 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 duality transformation. Uh, in the sense of the, there being an S transformation that is usually called the duality transformation, really sends xi to one minus i. And uh, sort of physically, the reason you, you could say that this sort of thing happens is because if you plot these potentials, right, what you'll see is that for a little while, uh, you know, before they go off to infinity, uh, for a little while, what's going on with these potentials is they're moving up and down between zero and one. So what, the, what this transformation xi goes to one minus xi does is it kind of flips the uh, the potential, uh, exchanging periods and dual periods, which is what we would think of as a, as a duality transformation. And you know, a happy consequence of this is that you know classical observables can be expressed in terms of uh, the automorphic forms of uh, these Hecke groups. So, can for example, yeah, Madhu, the or the what you call periods in dual periods are just curves which give you the fundamental group of this. Space you are looking at, okay? mm -hmm. with uh, uh, space with points removed. Okay? Yeah. Now it seems to me that this group you are looking, this Hecke group, yeah. are the mapping class group of this space. That is, you take the, remove the two points or n points and look at the mapping class group. That is, diffeomorphisms which leave the two points which are um, which are not deformable to the identity. I believe that they give you this Hecke groups, okay? and uh, they are. Somehow related to universal cover of SL2R. I think the last statement, I'm not sure. Um, but the SL2R, I believe, is correct. Correct. Well, I, right? um, well I mean, I, I thought the mapping class group was very different. Um, it will extend the two cycles for sure. Yeah. So, 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 so if you look at, uh, for example, um, a column vector made up of like periods and dual periods, then you're going to have a sort of general uh, symplectic matrix that's going to rotate all of these guys into each other, right? Is that what you're referring to? No, the mapping class group will extend the site. So mapping class group has an action on pi one. Right. So it is a, uh, so uh, the identity component will not have it because the, that will only deform the curves you are writing by homo, which are equal in curves up to homotopies. However, the non-trivial elements, which are not so the quotient of the diffeomorphism group mod the identity component is a mapping glass group, okay? Or the plane with two points removed. Okay? They will definitely change the cycles. There is one, it will start permuting the cycles. Okay? One can see that by drawing curves, okay? I see. I, I think that this Hecke groups you are getting are either those or their subgroups of those. Because I think that mapping glass group is what does the job. I think, but I'm almost sure, but I'm not, in, yeah. Long uh, ago, we did some work on this with Ramadas. Okay? I see. You know, see. the CMI. Okay? Uh -huh. 
then uh, we got involved with this sl2 r and this universal cover i see i i i, I don't know uh, well i i'm just looking at it uh, in i guess a much more pedestrian fashion uh, in the sense that i have i have these objects that i can compute that are associated to these cycles and then i ask the question what is it that's going to uh, exchange these guys for me so for example um, over here you, the, the way we usually define uh, the uh, the um, uh, complex structure modulus of let's say a genus one surface right is i take the the dual period and i take the period and i take dad by da right so uh, like let's say i call um, uh, sorry i'm using changing notation what i mean is i'm taking da check by da hat right that's how mm -hmm. i usually define this guy and over here really the if if you ask what are what are the, uh, the the periods and the dual periods they're sort of related to these uh, sorry they're sort of related to uh, these two f1s these gauss um, functions so if i exchange xi with 1 minus xi you see that basically this guy flips over mm -hmm. and and that roughly corresponds to tau going to 1 um, minus 1 over tau with yeah. i mean there are some factors that's where this lambda m comes in and so on but uh, that's that's roughly what the S action is talking about. So uh, you you may be right, Bal, but I I I don't want to say anything incorrect. So I okay. I'll, I'll okay. look into it maybe after. Yeah. There is another question which uh, um, well, you know that if you look at the x to the four potential uh -huh. in one dimension, that uh, uh, that potential the energy is not has an essential single isolated essential singularity a zero coupling Gaussian. And it is, and there's a there are papers by, I think Barry Simon, mm -hmm. which uh, in a very clever and beautiful way uh, resolve the singularity. This also tells what it is there and what are the Riemann surfaces like. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, mm -hmm. you're only getting square roots. I don't know how they reflect on the energy. Okay? I mean, these are on the cycles, mm -hmm. but for the energy, what is the nature of the singularity? I don't quite understand. Okay? Because you have to sum all the series and so forth, no? Right, right. Um, yeah. Uh, well, at this, so uh, so you when you say series, you mean like the the the, the formal series that I have in H bar. Yeah, uh, because I know. Yeah. So what one knows is, uh, sorry. No. Uh, take the case where you have fourth order polynomial. Right. Okay. Uh, it's positive, so it's a quartic oscillator. Yep. The quartic oscillator, the uh, the energy, the ground state energy. Or any energy, but ground state energy in particular, is not has an isolated essential singularity at the origin. Mm -hmm. it, that is that has been known for a long time, and uh, the best, the most prettiest work I know on that problem is due to Barry Simon. I believe it is given in his book. Okay? But Barry Simon resolved it by clever tricks, okay? and uh, he could tell what exactly it is and what happens on all the Riemann surfaces. It's a Essential singularity with the branch point attached. So he discusses what happens in all the Riemann surfaces. Mm -hmm. okay? And he was able to tell what happens. There are a lot of singularities on the cover. Right. right. But right. here I don't know what happens. Yeah. Because so you have the party potential here. Right. So 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 uh, the the problem that you're referring to, what, I mean, he's probably looking at a, a sort of uh, higher order problem which is looking at normal series of um, uh, coefficients uh, in an equal expansion of object is that no right? he doesn't do that i mean there are okay. people who did the border sum okay. numerically uh -huh. to find out what exactly the energy is there are a lot of uh, continuum fractions sum, uh, right. so continuum fractions which is uh, the, and then other people have done many other activities to find the energy mm -hmm. eigenfunctions Barry Simon did exact theory. He proved theorems one after another okay, in his paper, which is read the paper is readable. Okay. And there are all these beautiful results there. I see, I see. I, I will I I'm not familiar with this. Maybe, maybe I will take the look. Yeah, maybe related. But I don't see that in your calculations. Yeah. I, I at this at this stage I am just focusing on stage. I am just focusing on on uh, the um, I, I think uh, the uh, Yeah, Denjo. Uh, well, I think he is forced because of the coefficients in his polynomial to keep uh, couplings fixed. You can't go varying uh, to uh, to to look like uh, um, that 
the uh, the essential singularity happens at zero coupling in his case and i think you can't go to negative coupling maybe for the unless you can go for the largest value there no the maybe you do a, one does in expansion like he has done i think okay? you have an expansion no mm -hmm. it's a asymptotic series but there is a summation yeah this all the summation rules coming from mccall and others yeah. okay so that will give you a function of the coupling okay? the function of so h bar start, yes h bar so there is effectively a coupling also in this problem mm -hmm. okay? yeah so once they start analyzing what is the uh, analytic properties and this coupling also okay yeah so it is some and if there is any notion of convergence on the real yeah then um, it will be locally at least a real analytic function you can continue it right huh. so what so, happens yeah so so this is what i'm saying i'm saying that like i am not uh, so uh, the reason i said this is a higher order question is because you're looking now at this object as a function of h bar right yes. right now what i'm doing is i'm just saying that let me look at the pieces that make up the h bar expansion formally right okay and let me ask what are the relations between them okay okay so it, this is a sort of half step in between you know what what you were saying and and uh, 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 yeah this is kind of okay. halfway there okay yeah so um so yeah so so a uh, happy consequence of 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 this this identification of this modular uh, or this automorphic structure is that uh, the classical uh, observables can be expressed in terms of automorphic forms of hn and uh, again automorphic forms of hm are, are something that you know my collaborators and i have been working on for some time so just this is just an example uh, when you look at the let's say the classical uh, period uh, as a function of tau then it's given in terms of uh, a, a, as an expression like this uh, where e2 e4 and e6 are the eisenstein series corresponding to these uh, hecke groups uh, and this is true for any m and one of the nice things about this is that this formula unites a number of more complicated case by case expressions that have appeared in the literature so this just one one unified expression for it for all m um, okay so, so 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 far for the for the for the classical story uh, we can now sort of uh, now we now we come to the deformations part. So uh, let me just remind you of the problem that we faced earlier. We said that uh, you know for the higher genus cases, when quantum corrections are taken into account, the periods and dual periods are no longer proportional to each other, and obviously the same uh, d to n cannot give quantum periods that are different, right? It'll give you the same object. So the question is, how do we get around this? And the answer is we introduce these deformations. So we study what we call eta deformed models. So we just take a potential, uh, which is the usual potential, and then we add a sort of small deformation, right? So we kind of break this, um, this, this nice symmetry that we have, where eta is some small real parameter. And so what happens in this case is our potential is, is deformed, which means the roots of the potential are slightly different from the original problem. And our strategy will be to work uh, in the eta deformed theory and then take the limit of eta goes to zero in the end. Um, so for example, the, the, the Picard Fuchs equations are also deformed similarly, right? Because we have this new parameter in which to expand in. So let's say this is the uh, this is the Picard Fuchs equation governing the classical periods, and this admits an expansion in uh, eta. And so the periods acquire dependence uh, 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 or periods require uh, another index to keep track of the, the order in the eta expansion. So now I have a really awful looking object like this, uh, and it has the following specifications. It has the order in h bar, which is given by the, the superscript n. Uh, it has a, a dependence on the valley, which valley we're looking at. So in a genus G surface, you're gonna have G valleys. So uh, we're looking at K specifies the valley, and the order in the eta expansion is going to be kept track of using L, right? Now, classical Sorry, proportionality. Just, just, yeah. To, yeah. just to clarify, before this, you had no free parameter in your put, in your potential. Oh. Is that correct? I, I just had the energy. Energy was the only free parameter. Yeah, and and the, so okay, yeah, that's what I thought. So now you have a free parameter. Yeah. So uh, now uh, the, the classical proportionality of the wells means that uh, in this notation, right, that uh, uh, A100 is proportional to A200, but at higher orders in the eta expansion, this sort of proportionality is broken, right? Um, but let's see what happens when we, have this, uh, when we have this new kind of free parameter. What about the differential operators? 
Well, we find that the differential operators also uh, can be constructed in this case, even for the higher genus guys, and they admit an expansion in eta. So they look kind of like this. So you see, the, this is a sort of, uh, this expansion starts with a one over eta. And the fact that there's a one over eta piece kind of sheds light on why it was impossible to construct a D2N for the higher genus cases naively, right? Now the question is, uh, if there is a one over eta piece, then how do we take the eta goes to zero limit now? Because that's at the end of the day, we want to sort of make contact with the eta goes to zero limit. Uh, and uh, the way, we, the way we, uh, we, we do that is that we look at, let's say for example, the first quantum period, right? Which is A check two, right? Um, uh, we, want, we, we want to realize this as D2 acting on A check zero. Right, and so we we plug in these exp expressions. These that are that are large expressions for these objects, but for at least formally, this is what it's going to look like. Right, so the the the, the eta deformed periods have an expansion in eta. The differential operator has an expansion in eta, and uh, when we uh, when we construct uh, because we can construct these differential operators in an eta expansion, we see that uh, a check two or the first quantum period. Uh, corresponding to the first well in an eta expansion looks something like this. Okay. And now there's a, the, there are remarkable facts, but two remarkable facts about this. The first is that the one over eta piece coefficient actually vanishes. So when I act with uh, D minus one, which is the coefficient of one over eta uh, on the classical period, it actually vanishes. And uh, the second is that um, when I when I turn off the eta deformation, right? So the, the fact that I can the fact that uh, the coefficient of one over eta in this at this stage vanishes, what that means is that I can safely turn off the eta deformation at this stage, right? And one can actually check that um, the 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 first quantum period corresponding to the let's say the kth well is really an expression that looks like this. So what we've what we've shown here is that the first quantum period of the undeformed theory is determined by the differential operator acting on the eta deformed classical period, okay? And uh, one can actually check that uh, the same story is true for the higher order, um, let's say um, uh, the, the, the second quantum period, uh, A4, right? Which, which corresponds to Q4. And uh, you know, one can show that you know this this sort of works to all orders in the H bar expansion. Uh, finally, since the um, genus two example is is actually really sufficiently generic, we expect that this technique of the eta deformation will work in in very much the same way for uh, all higher genus Chebyshev wells. Uh, it's interesting that that the, when we introduce this no notion of an eta deformation, then it actually sheds light on why it's possible to construct the differential operators for the genus one system. So if you if you take a generic genus one system and you try uh, you introduce your eta deformation, uh, you will find that there is no one over eta piece for the genus one case. And so the eta goes to zero limit is well-defined and you just have like, let's say this guy. And it's well-defined purely at the level of the differential operators. And the, this demonstration, right? That, that uh, the, the eta deformed, once you turn on the eta deformations then you're able to do something that you were not able to do earlier, which is construct these differential operators uh, and actually reproduce the, the quantum periods from the classical ones. Uh, this has kind of an interesting uh, implication for this study of low orders, low orders resurgence, which is that since differential operators can be constructed when the eta deformation is turned on and when eta is small, as we assumed in the beginning, which is why we're doing this expansion, we can conclude that a small neighborhood of the locus cut out by Chebyshev wells in the space of hyperelliptic curves. You can imagine that this locus is like a small, thin tube or something around uh, this uh, Chebyshev wells, which are like a special kind of uh, potential in the space of hyperelliptic curves. Um, this, this region exhibits low orders, low orders resurgence, which greatly expands the set of examples for which this, this form of resurgence has been established. And also along the way, uh, you know, we have some cute results about automorphic structures displayed by Chebyshev wells, where uh, we used the correspondence between uh, the, the squares of the, the potentials that we're studying, which are the uh, squares of Chebyshev wells, and uh, the, uh, the Hecke groups, which are subgroups of SL2R. And we use this to resum classical observables. So um, I think that's, that's my talk. Thank you.
Thank, thanks very much, Mado. I couldn't find my unmute button. <laughs> um, and thanks for a very interesting talk. There are probably lots of questions. So, so yeah. the floor is open. Yeah, OK. Uh, so uh, at the beginning, you said uh, that this low order to low order resurgence uh, only happens um, in, in very special cases. Would that just be the case for arbitrary polynomials or but do you have a conjecture in, in, in the quantum mechanical situation? Um, well, we're still trying to sort of explore the extent to which uh, this is generic. We still don't believe that it is uh, a fully generic for all polynomial potentials. That's too broad. Um, uh, but uh, and, and uh, current, currently, we're trying to do some work where we, we, we hope to sort of clarify this space a little more. Uh, but at the moment, uh, what we can say with some certainty is that, you know, in a small neighborhood surrounding these Chebyshev polynomials, because you see the Chebyshev polynomials are very special. They have, you know, the everything is happening between kind of zero and one. Uh, and, and, and the fact that uh, uh, the fact that um, basically when you go to psi equals zero or psi equals one, then all of the A cycles or all of the B cycles contract. So there's something very special happening. Uh, for for this this kind of polynomial, so right now we just think that it's for this class of examples, but uh, it, it may be true that there is a there is a larger uh, space, uh, at least in the higher genus case. It is true for generic genus one systems. So for arbitrary cubic and quartic oscillators, uh, this property is true. This low orders low orders resurgence is true. For higher genus, we still don't know. Okay, thank you. Well, I have a couple of questions. May I ask? Yeah. There may be others, so I don't want to interrupt. But in any case, if one takes um, literally this language of uh, the zeros of the polynomial to roll down. Then let me look at what happens to the wave uh, from this. There is some echo. From where is it coming? Um, Do you get an echo? Yes, I, I can hear. Uh -huh. Maybe try now. Uh, you no, know, it is something. Somebody has opened it. I don't know what. Uh, no, I, anyway, I think it's fixed. Well. Yeah. Let me ask the question. Okay. So, <clears throat> So the wave function, because you have um, put two holes, okay, and they are square root branch points, the the generic wave function is um, is in the limits of the universal cover, okay, which in this case will be a four sheeted Riemann surface because each is square root, okay? right? And then it will transform by some representation of this uh, uh, this fundamental group of the original manifold. It will be deck, what they call deck transformations. Right, right. right. Well, uh, so, I'm wondering whether it shows up in your calculations also. You are not this, uh, address the issue of wave functions at all. The states, and right. the problem at all. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I, at this point, I have not. But but uh, so the one way to see it is that like I can. Uh, you remember the the way that I arrived at my uh, periods uh, and dual periods was via the WKB ansatz, hmm. right? Uh, yeah. So uh, so really, I do have the wave functions in the game. I can construct the wave functions once I have uh, uh, my, my periods and dual periods, hmm. right? And hmm. uh, I think that probably the thing that you're talking about is related to the fact that um, my um, the, the, the transformations of the, of, of the wave function itself correspond to the ways in which the periods and the dual periods kind of get mixed up. Um, yes, you can. Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah. So you can uh, imagine uh, going around one cycle and then going over the other cycle. Right, so right, exactly. They form a group. Yes. They form a group. Yes, okay. exactly. And I think that uh, that group is, I think, what you have called the Hecke group. I am not sure, but it may be what you have called the Hecke group. But let me ask this question again. Hmm. So the related issue is the which I was asking before is the. Uh, 
you have a plane with two holes okay and you have an sorry bal why do you keep saying plane with two holes i'm very confused about, i mean i'm, I'm not two, getting there are two branch points two branch points no i have i have as many branch points as i have um, yes uh, as zeros many as, of the, as the, uh, i understand uh, two i was thinking of the uh, simplest case of two okay, okay. okay. but you have like any number of branch uh, points uh, okay, okay 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 now <clears throat> Uh, from what in the case of um, here i am not completely sure in one of these cases i think it is in the case with two holes that may be by my memory is coming there is an action of sl to z on this space and what it does is to interchange the two cycles yes that you will so mm -hmm. it acts on the fundamental group in some complicated way yeah now, now when you go into the nature of the wave functions mm -hmm. okay the wave functions okay, will be on some universal cover of this space mm -hmm. okay, whatever it is and then you can ask how does sl2z act on the wave functions which is not by the original action because it is wave functions are now uh, in a bundle they are not in the base right okay? right so what is this group that is acting again i am recollecting old work okay? mm -hmm. uh, what happens is SL2Z undergoes a cover, uh, it becomes a, a different group. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to remember. And it is constructed in the following way. SL2Z is a subgroup of SL2R. Yeah. SL2R is has a, a fundamental group of SL2R is Z because uh, of the fact that it has a U1 sitting in SL2R. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's a, a rotation around an axis sitting there. Okay. So the universal cover of SL2R is some other group, which is, I think, called SL2R tilde or something. Okay? It is some cover of this one by Z. Mm -hmm. So you can ask, what is the inverse image of SL2Z there? Okay. okay. That is uh, some, you can characterize that group by relations as you wrote on, okay? uh, which you, I think it is t squared equal to 1 and st to the power of some power equal to right. 1. That was it. Yeah. My remembrance is that we got those similar relations or at least. So I'm thinking, and what they does, what it does on the universal cover is it acts on the wave function, mm -hmm. but changes the uh, elements of the deck transformation. It changes one representation of the wave function okay. to another representation. It okay? the representation. Yeah. I see. So, it must have a role in what you're doing, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I would be very interested in learning about because I, I mean, I don't know offhand. Uh, so what I do know is that there's, there's two groups at play and I don't know how they're related at this point. One is the uh, one is the um, um, the uh, set of, uh, it, it's basically a symplectic group that sort of rotates the cycles into each other, hmm. right? Uh, hmm. And then, then I have like in this special case, I have this like Heike group. Right. And my understanding is that because I have uh, this really special thing happening where all the periods and dual periods are proportional to each other and so on. Um, my understanding is that uh, effectively I can treat this as if it were a problem with just one modulus. Hmm. Right. But in general, if I had, if the coefficients were slightly different, right. Like as Denjo was saying, like, you know, the coefficients, the relative coefficients in the polynomial are fixed by this the requirement that it's a square of a Chebyshev polynomial, right? But if the, if the coefficients were slightly different, I would not have this property. Uh, and then I would have to deal with the full group. Um, mm -hmm. As far as the wave functions go, we haven't really sort of thought about the wave functions because our interest was really in sort of making a connection with, uh, at the end of the day, we want to sort of be able to say something about the spectrum. And, uh, you know, for our purposes, what we can do is what we were hoping to do and what we're in the process of doing is we're looking at um, the formal series in H bar that is constructed out of these uh, uh, these class uh, classical and quantum periods and dual periods, right? And then we're looking at a sort of generalized Bohr-Sommerfeld quantization uh, condition. Uh, and and uh, so we're trying to study the spectrum in, in that way. We have not thought about the wave functions. Okay. Um, Right. But is this this thing that you you mentioned, like uh, this is uh, this is work that you you had done in the past, is it? I have not. We we were not looking at this problem. Uh -huh. okay? We were looking at the problem of that's why I was getting confused at the beginning of uh, 
quantum gravity mm. on say two dimensional closed manifolds okay okay closed orientable let us say orientable mm-hmm. so orientable manifolds are given by the genus mm. ah. right so in that case you have handles okay right as you know and uh, cycles around each of the handles generates the fundamental group of that manifold yes that looks exactly in the case of two handles for example mm. that group is seems to, is um uh, certainly a subgroup of the fundamental group of a plane with two holes the plane with two holes has fundamental group which is a free group on two generators okay? yes uh, so that certainly is contained in this uh, fundamental group of two holes and you are considering one particular aspect of it namely the is quotient to get a z for it mm. get to whatever it is it's a four dimensional menu to get a pi one which is which has four elements okay? so uh, so four sheet of riemann surface okay? so that group we were discussing looks similar to what you are doing okay? however about the work on uh, they're not result on if, um, say the quartic potential mm-hmm. uh, it is a very ancient history okay? because one no knew long ago that it is divergent mm-hmm. and going there again mm-hmm. our our friend yes his thesis with pm matthews uh-huh. was exactly on this okay? i see yeah. and they developed summation procedures and numerically checked that it was good it was a good summation procedure okay? I see, I see. there were other people doing border summation and all those uh-huh. all that thing then came barry simon with his uh, proof of the uh, analytic structure right in the and uh, in the potential okay? mm-hmm. and so i would say in the higher order i don't know anything what happens to x is of 4, 6 if there is a result i do not know going there in may no okay so what i don't quite see is what is your relation so i am not i have not contributed to the potential problem mm-hmm. so issue is what is the relation of you what you are doing in the case of uh, i think two the quartic potential mm-hmm. two in known results in the uh, in actual potential scattering where yes. people have discussed yes. right 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 i guess to comment on this we are breaking up uh, maybe i should say i enjoyed the talk a lot uh, thanks I, uh, Mathu's talk was quite good. Uh, I it Sorry, I think I think Denjo is trying to say something, but we can't hear you. I'm breaking up. Huh. We can't hear you. You are breaking up. You are uh, chopped. I don't know what you have done, but you are chopped. Um. I was just if I if I'm not the name on the board sorry um is there something wrong with yeah, our uh, we can uh, we cannot understand the words too many people on like today uh maybe 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 you i mean uh, like maybe you could type it out i, I don't know if, uh, if, if there's a question or uh, a question or... actually i think it's gotten better Sam, now maybe you could try again uh, actually i think it's gotten better now it's intermittent uh, the no i was just going commenting that you can trade h bar for one parameter that you can have you have one overall scaling of x Mm-hmm. that you could put in there and i think it's it, that this is the coupling constant that ball is thinking of yes one can one can use that coupling constant yes and you yes. when that coupling constant is negative it will still be unstable i mean that the uh, the negative values of it i think they were used by lipitoff in the 54 case to uh, to estimate large orders in perturbation theory and they're used in the arguments for borel resummation but i i think they are that the point is that it's the that effectively when h bar goes to becomes negative is equivalent to what you're arguing 
because you can think of you can use the rescaling of uh, x to trade for one coupling constant i can comment on that when x is negative okay not x the coupling constant is negative okay this potential on the writing down goes to minus, minus infinity when x becomes very large okay in that case right, because the potential is real the operator schrodinger operator always allows self adjoint extensions always allows it is always essentially self adjoint because it, the potential is real and the theory is defined only if you tell which particular self adjoint extension you are dealing with at infinity okay so the problem start then a new problem appears at infinity but it can be resolved uh, the operator is only essentially self adjoint if you change the sign of the coupling so the problem i was referring to is when the potential is repulsive so it goes to plus infinity when x goes to infinity and then what happens at the origin when you have this x to the fourth term okay that is very simon's work can you hear me yeah yeah uh, we can hear you so that's it so lipetov i don't know what he did uh, I, I i did not know that he did quantum mechanics so i don't know but what i do know is that if x is negative that is the potential is not bound it goes to minus infinity when x goes to infinity mm -hmm. if quantum mechanically the problem is okay but there is a issue of how do i define the operator domain okay And that can be resolved okay that is i think resolution is known i don't know who did it but it is known okay the fact that it exists is known for a, a obvious it is known because the potential is real okay? mm -hmm. so from that you can infer that uh, there is a the deficiency in this is a equal so there is a um, there is a self adjoint there are self adjoint extensions but the spectrum will depend on the extension mm. okay but i think the case you are considering because of the square you had a square of t mm -hmm. the potential is uh, definitely uh, doesn't go to minus infinity it goes to plus infinity when x increases mm. yeah when x yeah i mean that's in one direction in the other direction it can still go to minus infinity you had an x to the fourth term no 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 so I, <laughs> no so if i if i if i look at uh, t3 halves that's like a cubic oscillator so ah. it, it sort of goes it, it goes to minus infinity at x when x goes to minus infinity and then it comes up and then it goes to plus infinity i'm ah, sorry then again that problem mm -hmm. as again this issue of the particular quantum theory one is dealing with okay? because of the fact that when it goes to minus infinity at one end you have uh, there is an issue of how do i pick the domain of the operator which particular self adjoint extension i am dealing with okay? there is that issue again it can be resolved by standard technique okay? so the spectrum will depend on that but in the other case i mean uh, the quartic case mm -hmm. when everything is everything uh, moves up yeah uh, right the, uh, the issue is shifts to what happens at the origin okay? because it is uh, x is a 4 so there are problems okay really? not problems uh, is uh, there some rich uh, mathematical structure there mm -hmm. i see i see so i was wondering how this ekal approach it connects up with that i don't know yeah uh, i would i would just say sort of generally that you know we we at this stage we're not really fully looking at uh, um the borel uh, the, the task of borel resumming these things mm -hmm. uh that's something that we're in the process of doing at the moment but uh, in this work at least we had not sort of studied that so um uh, that that is sort of work to be done work to be better i see okay incidentally i would like to say that like you know even in the cases of um, of uh, uh, the the situations where things have been borel resumed you know like the cubic or the quartic oscillator mm -hmm. a lot of the work has just been done on these two examples the very rich examples and uh, and you know the very uh, uh, very um, uh, insightful you know to work out but the, the 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 case of higher genus has not been explored very much Uh, hmm. and what one of the things that we are trying to do is to really look at the higher genus cases and try and use some machinery that mathematicians have developed to to sort of approach these problems 
can you do this calculation by uh, looking at the perturbation series around the origin the what you are doing uh, write down the borel transform okay? uh, write and down the uh, see how the where the power series are diverging hello where the power series ah. are hello diverging hello Sorry, Bal, I, I lost you for a second. Uh, can you say that again? The problem is of echoes. Okay. I'm trying to see how to actually do a calculation. Hmm. Okay. Uh, so, I, can I... Uh, this is not a very well-formed question. So, suppose I develop the perturbation series or the origin. Okay. And it uh, diverges. Okay. Yeah. So, in that case... I can do the borel sum. I can make a borel transform, okay. And the inverse transform is given by Laplace. Laplace yes. uh, transformation. This is it. So I can ask uh, when I do the borel transform, you get the entire function. Okay? Uh, uh, the entire function, I think, uh, which can be analytically continued in some, I think, some star-shaped domain. If I remember correctly, you know. Uh, so I can uh, presumably. Locate the singularities from the uh, Borel transform. Then can I then find the uh, use a perturbation series to find the action at the singularities and reconstruct the second term of the series? Yes, yes, that. that is. I can do that. Yes, right. So I can go on doing this. Yes. And then do a Borel transform again. Yeah. Then you just keep keep running that uh, yeah that that machinery. Oh. And each point. I simply take the perturbation series to compute the action. Exactly. Action yes. will be classic. Then redo the calculation. I yeah. can do that, no? Yes, yes. Oh, great. Great. Uh, I thought, uh, yeah, it was a guess. That's very good. Yeah. Yeah. In general, of course, this is a this is a difficult thing to do, which is why you know these calculations by Zinjusta are like very heroic because they sort of mm -hmm. sat in very primitive computer algebra. They sort I understand. Of sat in. Yeah. 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 Very good. Very good. Yeah. From your remarks, it will be quite easy. Okay, I, uh, yeah, Denzel. Denzel. Wait, I may just, yeah, I was just going to stop the recording unless there are other questions. It, it may improve uh, the uh, thing. Is that, is that okay? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your, your talk. I'm sorry about the broadband today.